Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. We are officially into Halloween episodes. We sure are. I mean, if it were up to me, like we say, we don't we don't keep any other um, history calendar, like Black History Month. We don't really heed that too much because we like to cover that kind of history all year round. I feel the same about Halloween. We should yeah. just be doing spooky things about bats and ghosts at every every turn we possibly can. Uh, but now it is officially October and Halloween time. I know not everyone wants Halloween all the time like I do. Um, the person we're talking about today, Johann George Schrepfer, is a little bit tricky. He's kind of a slippery snake in the historical record. And like some of our other Halloween episodes, uh, this one, we're not quite as fast to historical record because they kind of don't exist. And the mm-hmm. ones that do exist have been purposely clouded by Johan and his followers and his detractors. Everyone kind of told a different version of stories involving him and thus confusion. Um, <laughs> one thing I'll also mention, we went with the spelling of Schrepfer as S-C-H-R-E-P-F-E-R. You will also see it in lieu of that first E and O with an umlaut over it. Uh, just if you're going looking for more information, no, you might want to do two searches to get... The results for both of those. Um, I did that this morning looking for artwork uh, to go on our social media. And still the best I could do was artwork of a person who was inspired by him and not anything directly related to him. Yeah, it's he's he's uh, like I said, he's difficult to pin down. There are also some um works of art that were done about him that are clearly fanciful, right? Like they're like, someone imagining what it was like to be at one of his spiritual events. Um, The other thing I want to say, even though this is, for me, a jolly time of Halloween talk, um, this one is one of those episodes, and I feel like we have had to make this particular heads up so many times that I should apologize lately. Uh, This is another episode where we do discuss um, death by suicide. So I want to make sure, if that's not for somebody, that they know to to hop right out of this one. Uh, And it it comes up a good bit towards the end. So know that. But yes, uh, this is going to be some necromancy, some charlatanism, and some weirdness. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and some people who don't want to believe that anything spiritual could be disproven. So right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... As Holly just alluded to, what we know about Johann George Schrepfer's origins is actually pretty slim on details. He is believed to have been born in Nuremberg in 1738, although sometimes you'll see sources claim 1739. He didn't really receive a formal education and was often described as having coarse behavior, so it's generally believed that he grew up poor We really don't know anything about his parents, though. He's said to have had siblings who he was not close to. Schrepfer himself was known to also tell wildly differing versions of his origins, and this was also true of his eventual followers. It's just not possible to feel confident about really any of it. Even when you're looking at articles written by historical scholars, the details are so different in some cases that I'm like, well... I can't go to Germany and dig through the records. (laughs) And I don't speak German, so that wouldn't help anyway. So I'm just going to have to point out where there's disparity. At some point, Johan is said to have started working as a cooper, although that doesn't seem to be something he did for long. It's also not something that comes up in every version of his story. The Seven Years' War started in 1756, although you will sometimes see that extended to 1754 as the French and Indian War began that year, and it's one of the many conflicts that overlap in this larger conflict. Additionally, sometimes the start is given uh, much earlier on a much longer timeline of being more than 20 years long because its origin points involve other conflicts even before that. So as a crash course, and we're doing this just to give you a sense of what was going on in the world when Schrepfer was alive, 
Here are the basic basics of the Seven Years' War, which had all of Europe's major power bases involved. Prussia and Great Britain got into a fight with France and Austria, and the Austrian Habsburgs were trying to regain Silesia. All of this is tied into the War of the Austrian Succession, which started in 1740. It's one of the reasons that the length of the Seven Years' War gets a little stretchy, but this war was also pretty amoeba-like in its geographical spread. In North America, most of the conflict was based on this tug-of-war between England and France regarding each of their claims on territory and their trade potential. It also reached into India and West Africa and the Caribbean. And if you remember our episode on the Black Hole of Calcutta, that was part of the Seven Years' War as well. This whole thing has been called the First World War on occasion, most notably by Sir Winston Churchill, and that is probably how it felt from a European perspective, for sure. All of the countries involved were weakened financially by the whole war effort, and they all lost a lot of men, not just to the conflict, but to disease. And that, of course, would have been true of the civilian population as well, especially the disease spread through the warfare. It is unsurprising that in the wake of a massive and lengthy conflict like this, there was a sort of sense in Europe that the world had changed, but there wasn't really a clear vision of what it had changed into or what the future was going to look like. And as a consequence, people were unsettled and seeking refuge or guidance in the ideas of philosophy and religion and mysticism. And Johann Georg Schrepfer found a path in that uncertainty to gaining his own power and wealth, although ultimately that path would lead him to an early death. Schrepfer served in the Prussian army during the Seven Years' War, though in 1761 he appeared in Leipzig and he lived and worked there from then on. So it doesn't seem like he stayed in the military all the way until the war ended later in the 1760s. In August of 1761, he became a citizen of Leipzig and started operating a wine tavern in the city. Just a month later, he married a tailor's daughter from Leipzig named Johanna Katerina Hare. And then after several years in the business, Johann left his first tavern. He started running a coffee shop in the center of town called Weisleder's Coffee Wirtschaft, and that was at the corner of Klostergast and Barfußgassen. If you look up that intersection today, you can see it's still pretty much right at the center of Leipzig. That business wasn't one that Schrepfer started from scratch. It had already been in operation. It was well known when he took it over in 1769. That would become the epicenter of his mystical demonstrations. At some point in his life, Schrepfer became involved in Freemasonry. And as we've covered on the show before, Freemasonry grew out of stonemason guilds of the Middle Ages and then expanded to include members outside of that vocation. Freemason groups, which were organized into lodges, were spread throughout Europe and became numerous enough that they started to organize in groups of lodges under Grand Lodges. The first of those Grand Lodges was founded in 1717 in England. And because of the widespread nature of the lodges, some of them began to incorporate different symbolism and rituals into their philosophies and meetings. There's really some debate about whether Schrepper really became a member of the Freemasons or if he may have just been part of a group in Nuremberg. But at the time he was showing interest in the group in Leipzig, there were two primary branching ideologies within Freemasonry. One was what's often called the Scottish Lodge or the Templar Lodge, and that was considered the group of strict observance. They sought to attain a full understanding of the world and spiritual matters, was often referred to as highest knowledge, and they were doing that through research. And then the other was a group that was more aligned with Rosicrucianism. This branch sought knowledge and understanding through means that we might describe today as metaphysical or even paranormal. And this could include everything from practicing magic to contacting the spirit realm. Schreffer was a lot more interested in the more mystical ideology. Yeah, this is a very simplified version of all of the things... <laughs> going on in Freemasonry. I feel like that's one of those topics that every time it comes up, we have to caveat that, like, partially because it was a secret society, and it still exists, but much more secretive at this point. There are a lot of machinations of it that are 
we only know through various accounts that, again, contradict each other, right? Like right. that whole Templar thing, there are some that believe that the Knights of Templar could somehow be uh, contacted through <laughs> through various means and, like, regain power. And um, there was a lot going on. There's also the, the idea that there were Rosicrucians that joined the Freemasons to kind of plant those more mystical seeds and, like, start this division. I did not dig into all of that. <laughs> Just know that there's a lot of stuff like that going on in the backdrop of this story. At this point, though, the main lodge of Leipzig, which was called Minerva zum Zirkel, which is Minerva to the Circle in English, um, and Minerva was in the strict observance camp, which Schrepfer found frustrating. And he came to the conclusion that such a limited approach to gaining knowledge of spiritual matters was a corruption of the goals of Freemasonry, and that Minerva Lodge was inherently unprincipled. So he started his own lodge out of the coffee house. And the member roster of his lodge actually grew pretty rapidly because in breaking from the mainstream Freemasons, Shrepfer took in members who had been denied entry into Minerva. He also admitted women into his lodge, which was absolutely forbidden by Freemasonry at the time. That's a whole other complicated issue. Uh, and because he was quite charismatic, Shrepfer also managed to lure away members of the Minerva Lodge who had been in good standing, but also felt like they weren't learning everything they could. He also publicly spoke out against the Minerva Lodge, he claimed that his new group was closer to the ideals of Freemasonry, and he went so far as to write and distribute a pamphlet about Freemasonry. He distributed that all over the town. This was considered a really aggressive thing to do, because in that pamphlet, he disclosed detailed information about the Minerva Lodge initiation rituals. These were considered Freemason secrets. He also accused the Leipzig Lodge of taking money from members as part of promoting them to higher levels of masonry and of lying to new members by promising them more knowledge and enlightenment than they could actually deliver. I have to say, he was sort of a genius of a smear campaign, right? Like, he knew exactly how to position this whole thing to be like, they are exploiting your desire for knowledge. I... We'll show you knowledge, and I'm not corrupt like them. Uh, that smear campaign was not well received, <laughs> but Shrepfer continued to escalate his accusations until he had gotten so aggressive about it, he was finally arrested for disorderly conduct over it. He was also sentenced to <laughs> what is listed in the historical record as 200 Arsprügel. If you speak German... I hope I did not offend you with that because that translates in the kindest terms to lashes on the behind. The literal translation that I got when running it through an internet translator was a little uh, less appropriate for an all ages show. For a clean rated <laughs> podcast. <laughs> yeah. So in addition to that physical punishment, he also had to sign a document that acknowledged his crime and its consequences to be punished in the papers of the town. And while presses did indeed run that document with Shrepfer's signature, he claimed that the signature was forged and that he had never been punished. He continued to say publicly that the Freemasonry of the Minerva Lodge was illegitimate. But though many thought he was being a nuisance and a pain in the neck, he was able to acquire a letter from the Grand Master of Freemasonry in Germany that validated him as a Freemason. Not only did this give validation to his sort of separate branch order, but it also meant that he could go to the Minerva Lodge if he wanted to, even as he continued to speak out against it. And yes, it is absolutely valid to wonder if that document was legit. Coming up, we'll talk about the nature of the meetings at Shrepfer's Coffee House. First, we will pause for a quick sponsor break. <laughs> Johann Schrepfer's Coffee House Lodge and its policy to admit people that Minerva Lodge would not. But that doesn't mean that it was open to anyone. 
prospective members had to pass a screening, which was conducted by Schrepfer himself. And this is where we really have to start discussing what the Coffeehouse Lodge was actually doing at its meetings and initiations. We mentioned already that Schrepfer was interested in the more mystical approach to attaining higher knowledge. So Johann's leadership of these meetings at the coffee house quickly turned into demonstrations of necromancy. For a quick point of clarification here, a lot of times in modern pop culture storytelling, necromancy is associated with things like reanimating the dead. But the real definition of necromancy is conjuring spirits of the dead or communicating with the dead often as a divination tool or, in a wider sense, using magic or sorcery. So when we say Schrepfer was engaging in necromancy, that's what we're talking about, the sense of conjuring spirits, not reanimating the dead. No, this is not a zombie story. I apologize if you were hoping for one. <laughs> <laughs> These conjurings have been called performances, and Schrepfer is usually described as a charlatan. But his ability to convince people who attended these meetings that they were in the presence of otherworldly spirits was pretty impressive. In these rituals, Schrepfer would show his followers either what he called pneumatiche or pneumatic necromancy, in which he straight up just called directly to spirits, or as an alternate, elementarish or elementary necromancy, in which he used light to bring forth spirits. Accounts of these ceremonies describe seeing apparitions that were clear as day to everybody present, although they had a vapor-like quality, because Shepard would call up spirits from other time periods. Their clothing was described as having been appropriately period, although how many of the people giving these accounts were experts on historical clothing, that's certainly worth wondering. I know I'll see something in a movie and be like, that looks great, and it is super wrong. All you need to do to know how not correct people have various time period clothing is do a search for Victorian dress on the internet and you'll get a million Edwardian things. Like, Mm -hmm. this isn't necessarily, like, a big important problem unless you're doing it. I'm just saying it's worth questioning the accounts of correct period dress in these spirits. Right. So attendees also marveled at seeing spirits in various emotional states, including just obvious distress. Schrepfer put his conjured spirits into three categories, which were good, medium, and damned. (laughs) I don't know why that scale tickles me. It cracks me up. It's like, you're good, you're damned, Eh, medium. Like, I'm like, is that partially damned? I don't know what that means. I feel like this inspired the good place. (laughs) (laughs) I think you're not far off. It's a similar approach. So these ceremonies began late at night, usually midnight. And as the methodologies of setup are examined, things, of course, start to seem pretty suspicious. So for one, Schrepfer would insist that no one could stand up from the table where they were seated during these. That was, according to Johann, because they would be in serious danger if they did, and he could not control the spirits if humans were up and moving around. One way Schrepfer convinced people that he truly was conjuring the spirits of the dead was by bringing spectral versions of famous people to the seance table. That includes prior podcast subject Johann Friedrich Struency and his friend Enevold Brandt, who were executed in 1772 for manipulating King Christian VII of Denmark by exploiting his mental instability. The trial and execution had been widely reported throughout Europe, and so this would have been a really thrilling and sensational duo to appear in spectral form at these seances. Not only did they appear to Shrepfer's followers, they also did so while holding their decapitated heads. That would be, um, that would be a wower. Very dramatic. Yes. Shrepfer did not keep these ceremonies confined just to his coffee house. He actually traveled with them. He performed several such necromancy rituals in Dresden in 1773 and 74. And in some instances, when he was doing these, he would do tricks like send a spirit away on an errand far away and then have them return with some sort of evidence of their projection elsewhere, like a note that was signed by someone known to be in another town or city. 
To show his command of the spirit world, Schrepfer once conjured a spirit that appeared to the gathered people surrounded by flames and pleading for the necromancer Schrepfer to torture him no more. In that particular instance, Johann said that it had been too dangerous a trick and that he would never repeat it. He also would not take requests. Uh, A person attending one of his ceremonies couldn't, in the course of the ceremony, ask for a specific person to be brought forth from the afterlife. Who was called was generally entirely up to Shrepfer, and he would also perform magic sometimes out in the open of the countryside, allegedly causing storms to run in or to cause stars to shift their brightness. When a ritual or ceremony was over, Shrepfer used familiar religious symbols and tools to wrap things up. He brought out a crucifix that he said helped keep attendants safe. He would bless the people who were present. He would also use holy water, although whether this water truly had been blessed is not known. He also used these things to bring himself down from the experience. He was said to have had to fight off demonic energies as he performed his rituals. And the crucifix, he told his followers, was a way to help keep himself as well as them safe. He made it clear that he could be killed by this very dangerous work. I feel like he's such a great showman. Uh, and Johann's interviews with potential new members, remember we were talking about who he let in, was right in line theatrically uh, with these secret meetings. So these encounters with, with potential members would begin pretty benignly with a little bit of chat. He would ask the person about their thoughts on spirituality and the afterlife, and he would claim then that the integrity of the applicant was reflected in glasses of water which he had had set out on the table between them. So he would pick up the water and examine it, and if it was cloudy when he looked at it or it tasted odd, he would proclaim that the person's intentions were not genuine and they should not be admitted. But if the water was clear and tasted correct to Shrepfer, they were accepted and initiated because they were trustworthy. This whole system was, of course, devised by Shrepfer. It's not as though you could point to any written ancient (laughs) texts and see this weird water ritual. So no one could ever claim that he had executed this examination incorrectly. As his group of followers grew, Shrepfer made another bold move in mid-1774. He staged a coup at the Minerva Lodge. He literally went into a meeting with a pistol and forced the lodge master out at gunpoint and then appointed himself as the new master. And this worked. We have talked about Shrepfer drawing a lot of followers while also courting legal trouble for harassing the Freemason Lodge of Leipzig. But one of the things we have not talked about a whole lot is his critics, and he had a lot. This is not a case where modern eyes can really look at what he was doing in the 1760s and 1770s and say, oh, clearly he was a charlatan and people then were fools. You can't have any sort of superiority about that because people at the time were saying that And he was deeply controversial, as you might imagine, as someone who walks into a private meeting with a weapon and takes over would be. In launching a public campaign of criticism against the existing Minerva Freemason Lodge and then creating his own group of followers, Shepard had also established his own faction of defenders. By the time he took over the Freemason Lodge, his followers were ready to go up against any detractors. This often played out in writing in the papers of the day as doubters sent spies to his ceremonies and seances to try to get proof that this whole thing was a fraud. There were accounts from some planted attendees that they recognized some of the ghosts as people they knew in their everyday lives. In one instance, a doubter quietly locked the door to the ceremony room as he entered, which resulted in the spirits not being able to get in. (laughs) Yeah, that was like a clear, hey, you know why you can't conjure spirits? Because I locked the door, dude. Um, but his believers were absolutely not having this. When Even when they were confronted with these cases where people had obviously thwarted Shrepfer's performances, his believers dug in. They were entirely certain that they had seen the veil between the physical world and the spirit realm fall and that Shrepfer had caused it and was orchestrating these amazing things. 
And the thing was, no one was able to come up with a solid idea regarding how exactly he had accomplished some of the things that they had seen. Even the skeptics were a little troubled by this. We're going to circle back to this in a moment. Uh, One very common theory that's often discussed in all of this, particularly in the case of Shrepfer's hardcore believers, is that he was manipulating their state of mind in various ways. Often, the descriptions of the pre-seance rituals involved things like fasting. Then the attendees were given some refreshments, which Shrepfer provided. One item that comes up repeatedly and stands out as kind of odd is salad. But there was, there was also punch. There was a whole lot of punch. So it's entirely possible that people who had not eaten for a while were then put into a very dark room and given something intoxicating, they would probably buy into some things that might not pass scrutiny in the light of day with a clear head. They were not drinking a bunch of punch on a mostly empty stomach. Listen, if I don't eat enough protein on a regular basis, I see spirits. I mean... Coming up, we are going to talk about the claims that started to unravel Shrepfer's public persona. And we will get to all of that after we hear from the sponsors that keep Stuff You Missed in History class going. In 1774, Schrepfer claimed that he was a French nobleman and that his name was Baron Stein von Steinbach when he visited Dresden to perform at court. He was not appearing as himself. He had basically taken on this other persona. This lie caught up to him pretty quickly when a French envoy to Saxony heard of the alleged French noble with connections to the spirit realm and asked Schrepfer for documentation of his French lineage. This obviously fell apart, but Schrepfer is said to have performed quite a thrilling and terrifying seance even after his unmasking by all of this. But though he had supporters there, he also had a lot of people that wanted him gone. And this whole, like, pretending to be someone he wasn't had not helped matters. So he soon left Dresden and went back to Leipzig. Throughout all of this, and even when money was tight for a lot of people in Saxony and Leipzig specifically, Schrepfer always seemed to be doing okay financially. Most of his money at this point seems to have been coming from high-ranking believers who were loaning him money with the understanding that he was using it to further his work of achieving an understanding of the highest knowledge and that he was going to share that knowledge with them. There also appears to have been a promise that he was using his clairvoyant abilities to solve the financial problems of the region, but the debts and the false promises were quickly outpacing his ability to live up to them. Yeah, it's unclear if that weird choice to pretend to be a French noble might have been part of a an effort at a money-making scheme. We don't really know. But on the night of October 7, 1774, Schrepfer is said to have performed a seance at his coffee house, and his ritual had been so powerful as to bring several spirits to the group. So many spirits, and in such strong manifestations, it was said that Schrepfer suggested that instead of closing the normal way, that everyone present leave and just allow the spirits to disperse on their own. There are also accounts that he had a dinner with some of his closest friends that night. But sometime after midnight, Johann suggested they all go for a walk, and he told those that were with him that they were going to be part of another significant happening and indicated that it was singular and unusual, like basically we're going to go into the woods and I'm going to show you something very special. They went to a forest known as the Rosenthal, and Schrepfer peeled off from the group. Shortly thereafter, a shot was heard, and Schrepfer was found dead, apparently of suicide. Most of the accounts of the people who were with Johan in the forest that night indicated that he was, as we just stated, dead when they found him. But there were a few people who claimed he was not dead, but injured, and that he had vanished before them as though he was crossing through the veil that he had so frequently skirted as he had in these seances. For some, there were hopes that the death was part of what would be Schrepfer's greatest performance of necromancy, that he would raise his own spirit from the beyond, surely that would prove the depth of his enlightened knowledge. 
But the evidence that Schrepfer left behind was void of any mystical promise. Quite the contrary. He had written letters to his closest friends, telling them that he intended to end his life. He had also told his wife this. He left behind a heavy parcel, it said. It contained, he claimed, the secrets he wanted his followers to know. So imagine holding such a box full of possibility, and then the disappointment of opening it to find underclothes and rocks. There was nothing in there. Now, this is another point where we find two very different versions of this story specifically related to this package of rocks and underclothes, although no one seems to have any variation on the fact that it contained those items and nothing mystical. But in one version, that parcel is opened before Shrepfer's death, and that is the moment at which he realized he had been revealed as a fraud and had no way out. We should note, too, that though his death was ruled a suicide, there have been, from the moment it happened, people who ardently believed that someone else was involved, and either that he was murdered or that he was forced to take his own life. Even after his death, Johann George Schrepfer was an issue of debate. In 1775, so just a year after he died, theologian Christian August Crucius wrote an opinion article about Schrepfer and his work in which he cited an account by an observer who remained anonymous. He was basically saying, I talked to a person who said this. Crucius's main concern was not even whether the necromancer was the real deal or not. It was the fact that he had blasphemously combined Catholic and pagan rituals, something Crucius saw as a harbinger of the Antichrist's coming. But that publication was itself criticized as being extremist and alarmist and lacking in real critical thinking. As discussion of Schrepfer's work and Crucius's take on it continued, there emerged a fairly popular take, particularly among intellectuals, that one, Schrepfer had been a charlatan, and two, his believers were people who were gullible or people who were just plain desperate to find a little hope, or in the case of Freemasons, were people who fully expected some sort of enlightening and mystical phenomena to be shown to them because that was kind of the promise. One of the great German words that I came across while reading about this whole debate among scholars and theologians was uh, hocus pocus strike, which is hocus pocus pranks. I love that word. Uh, to some degree, Schreffer's brief blaze as a mystical leader, remember this only happened over the course of a couple years, had kind of opened the door to discussing the idea of magic and mysticism among intellectuals in a way that was current and had real world implications. While most historians would agree that Schrepfer was not actually conjuring spirits, there is some debate about whether he might have thought that he was. Some of his personal writing does, according to historians, seem to suggest that he was trying to truly devise a magical system that explained ways to connect with the spirit realm. Yeah, there are some uh, theories that, like, even though he was staging things, he saw those, any actors or tools he was using as kind of, like, ways that he was helping to manifest things that he may have believed. I don't know that I buy into that, but it's an interesting way to look at it. Uh, There are two artifacts associated with Schrepfer that are part of the collection of the Museum Naturellen Cabinet Waldenburg. Through these items, we get a little more information about exactly how Schrepfer convinced people that he had brought forth spirits with his rituals. We mentioned earlier in the episode that even skeptics had difficulty figuring out how Schrepfer might be achieving some of the visual effects that they saw in his seance performances. And the connection between that mystery and these objects is through one of Schrepfer's friends, Johann Heinrich Link the Younger, Link had a father with the exact same name, and sometimes, even in places you would think would get it right, it's the elder Link that Schrepfer's name is connected to. That's impossible, though. Johann Heinrich Link the Elder died in 1734 before Schrepfer was even born. Link the Younger, like his father, was a pharmacist. That's part of the problem with those two getting confused. There is also another Johann Link, that spells his name slightly differently, that also worked in naturalism and botany. They all three get very, very, very mixed up in the historical record. 
But Link the Younger that we're talking about today was a member of the Minerva Lodge, and Link is said to have met Shrepfer because Shrepfer needed the help of a pharmacist to prepare the various things that he gave his followers in preparation for ceremonies. But it turned out that Link was also a hobbyist in the area of things like optics, and that is how we discover two devices that were listed in Link's personal catalog as having been used in spiritual demonstrations that he staged with Shrepfer in the garden of his house. The first of these objects is a magic lantern. This is a sort of proto-slide projector consisting of a metal box with a slit in it the user would insert a small painted glass plate into that slit with a light source inside the box, a candle. An image would be projected through a simple lens. And there was also a small chimney-shaped attachment to the top so the hot air from the candle could escape. The other item in the museum collection associated with Schreffer and Link working together is a Geister Kosten, or ghost box, this is a variation on Lanterna Magica. It's made to look like a miniature coffin. Yeah, it's very cool. Um, so these two items pretty clearly point out that they are using Hocus Pocus. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, There were, though, people who theorized that something like these objects was being used in Shrepfer's gathering. Uh, It just had never been proven. And in that back and forth about morality and gullibility that we talked about playing out in the press in the years following Shrepfer's death, writer Friedrich Nikolai had gotten pretty close to describing this illusion, writing, quote, As for me, I think the whole thing is an artificial scam. If the other circumstances agree, then I would have the suspicion that a magic lantern was primarily used there. The following circumstances also strengthen my suspicion of a magic lantern. The spirits seem to move without moving their feet, only as if floating. By moving the image in the magic lantern, one can let the apparition float away, but not impart any particular movement to the feet. For the same reason, the spirits must have carried their arms and hands on their chests. They also appear in different light. The faces of the spirits look like formed haze, which can even be accomplished by means of smoke. The two mirrors in which he often used to look give further reason for this suspicion. These objects have given Shepper an interesting legacy that's outside of any of his mystical claims or controversies. He's often cited as an inspiration for the phantasmagoria horror theater trend that started in Europe in the decades after his death. We've talked about that trend on the show before. Mm -hmm. Some promoters even advertise their shows as being Shrepfer-esque. And it is uh, an illustration of one of those that will be on our social media uh, when we post about this episode. Yes. Uh, Yeah, Shreffer's a weird one. It's very interesting to me because he is one where if you do any reading on him, and there isn't a a lot in English language, um, most of it is in German, but it's almost as though every person who has ever written about him takes a very different approach to it and focuses on like a different aspect of his short but very fascinating life. Um, Like, some will focus a lot on that claim that he was a French noble and that he was using that. Some will focus more on, like, the idea of him as a necromancer. Others will focus more on him kind of waging this war with Freemasons. But they're all kind of happening simultaneously in a very, very, just over the course of a couple years. So uh, it's a, a fascinating thing to try to pull apart such a brief period of time of one person that is kind of jam-packed with so much weirdness. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a couple of pieces of listener mail. The first one is from our listener, Catherine, who writes about Henry VIII's armor. She writes, Hi, I enjoyed hearing about the field of cloth of gold in today's episode. I had never heard of it before. When you mentioned Henry's armor, it made me think of this video I saw years ago. A man in typical knight's armor races through an obstacle course against a firefighter and soldier wearing first light and then full gear armor. It's surprising how nimble all of them are while wearing such cumbersome outfits. Uh, And then attaches a picture of her kitty, who thinks nothing is better than completely messing up the tablecloth unless it's maybe playing with an ice cube. That cat is real cute, and it looks very autumnal, so I'm very, very happy. Uh, (laughs) uh, Katie, thank you so much for this one. I had mentioned in that episode on Field of Cloth of Gold or Behind the Scenes, I don't remember which, that there is a... 
a museum uh, video. I think I listed it in the show notes for the main episode that you can go see where someone has put on like that, that very, very articulated armor of his and they're showing just how much movement it had. So I wanted to mention that because it is fascinating. Yeah, I watched that video when we got that email and uh, I had it. I don't remember how many minutes long it was, but I was like, what a nice little break to start my day watching this. Uh-huh. Um, and I am still talking about butterflies. So, uh, <laughs> but this is one of such joy and discovery. Several people have written to us to mention that, yes, absolutely still happening. Kids visiting uh, uh, Monarch um, you know, science setups. Uh, I do want to mention because our listener Anna wrote, or Anna, I'm not sure which way she pronounces it, that um, she gave a shout out to the Detroit Zoo, which has apparently a permanent uh, and excellent butterfly exhibit. So if you're in that area, check that one out. But my other listener mail is actually from our listener, Christine, who writes, Hello, I am so happy to finally have something to share with you at the perfect time. A couple of weeks ago, I was traveling in Quebec and stopped at this roadside hotel. I was walking my pup along the parking lot not far from the highway and saw something yellow and black in the milkweed. With a wasp allergy in the family, I am always attuned to yellow and black bugs, but as I looked closer, my heart skipped a beat. I have known for years that milkweed is important to monarch butterflies, but I have never seen monarch caterpillars in real life, let alone at a roadside hotel. There were four that I could see, and I didn't look very hard. Check out the photos attached. I've also attached a photo of what I think is a cocoon, but you mentioned they don't tend to do that on the milkweed. After a long, long drive, seeing these beauties completely brought me peace. I'm also sharing photos from our travels of Dexter, my beagle puppy, who will be one in mid-September. Uh, she says, by the way, did you ever have t-shirts made for people who have listened to the entire Stuff You Missed in History class catalog? I still have about 250 to go, but I feel this will be an achievement I will be very proud of. The answer to that question is yes. It's on our Tee Public site. And it says, uh, I have my PhD in SY. And HC, I think. HC. I literally am like, am I getting these letters out of order? Because I <laughs> will do it when I'm not looking directly at it. Um, but she shared her beautiful pictures of monarchs. It's not completely unheard of for them to put, I don't think, uh, um, one of their cocoons on milkweed. It's just not as common as as other things. But we have to talk about this beagle puppy because Dexter is extraordinary. Uh, beagles are very much beloved in the Fry household. It is my husband's favorite, favorite kind of dog. He grew up with a, a beagle mix that he absolutely adored named Digby. Um, so... This dog is weaponized cute. It's the cutest thing on the planet and dangerous because beagles are smart and they will take your credit card and buy things, is what I think in my head. Um, (laughs) They won't really. Dexter's an angel, I have no doubt. Uh, But Christine, thank you, because that is such a joyous little discovery moment. And I I love the idea that people are are out looking for butterflies more than ever now. Uh, If you would like to share any such moments of discovery or information, you can do that. It's easy as pie. You can just write to us at historypodcast at iheartradio.com. You can also find us on social media as Missed in History pretty much everywhere. And you can subscribe to the podcast on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.